This is the final word, story time, 118. It's the, what is it? It's Thursday, the 5th of January. It's a couple of days after we thought we'd be recording this, Jeff. It's Stumps Day 2, where you are. Um, You've been watching the third test match between Australia and South Africa. I was up till Mm 4am watching that as well. Then a few other things happened at 4am for me. Uh, But why don't we start with you? How are you going? And what happened in the last two hours of play? I see Kawaj is a 195 not out and Travis Head was on track for like a 70 ball ton before getting out. Maybe you should start by giving me like a a 15 second summary of the final session. (laughs) Uh, The final session was basically Travis Head just making tired bowlers very sad by coming out and thrashing them uh, 70 off 59 balls. Had a great time, eventually got caught on the fence. Um, Looked a little bit sad about it, but not too sad about (laughs) it. Matthew Renshaw got a bat for three overs. um, And then they got called off for rain. Yeah, so Renshaw's had a hit. Um, Kawaja's 195 not out, so didn't get time to try to get to the 200 that he's never made before. But, you know, um, rain keeps doing its thing. And then this being the final word, once I'd recorded the Daily Show, edited and uploaded that, I then set about researching the rest of my numbers for storytelling. Time and now it's 8.30 p.m. and I'm still at the fucking SCG and we're going to record story time and then I'll find some time to edit it and then we'll put it out because yeah, that's how we do things. It's a bit like that at the moment and I should, I'll should i take you all into my confidence. I've already told you this, Jeff, but we are probably in labour at the moment. So the old final word moniker of can't stop, won't stop. I, I finished up at, yeah, like I say, about 4 a.m. my time and went upstairs and Rachel's like, I've just got a feeling there's stuff going on. And when we woke up properly at at eight o'clock, she's like, I've got more um, evidence to suggest that we are having a baby at some point in the next little while. So she's not like having contractions or anything like that, but in all probability, Mm -hmm. this will be the day when, when full blown labor starts and, and so it will be. And then number two will (laughs) arrive. So um, all the fun and games. So yes, all the more reason why we needed to get this story time in the can, because it might be a little while before I'm next on the tools. (laughs) Well, you know, it would be fitting for us if you were like, just slow the contractions a bit, do some deep breathing. I've just got to knock out an hour or so of podcasting, um, and then we'll. Then I'm just we'll going to. I'm just going to tell you about a West Indian batsman called Teddy Hode. Um, um, <laughs> I have some very pressing business to attend to <laughs> regarding what happened in 1911 at Adelaide Oval uh, between <laughs> South Africa and Australia, uh, and, and once we've taken care of that important business. We'll get back to the matters of 2023. Oh, well, that's exciting. Um, so, but look, the, we, we'd better just get a podcast out of the way. We probably should. Uh, Jeff, uh, what are we going to do? What, what's what's the game we play? Nerd Pledge. Nerd Pledge. I wonder if the cleaners can hear me. It's just me and many cleaners at the moment um, who I, I think I've dissuaded from coming in here for the next hour, I hope so, <laughs> um, anyway. But Nerd Pledge is a game. It, that's the best thing about it. It's a game that we play with people on the internet, a reverse quiz. Some people help us make this show. They send through contributions financially so that we can pay to make the show and they send through numbers that relate to cricket, not numbers that don't relate to cricket. And we don't know what they mean, but we have to figure it out. That's the game. That's the premise. For instance, we've got a double header first up, which is 149. It's one pound 49 for Jason Wilkins. It's one dollar 49 for the real patch clap. If you've been listening regularly, you'll know that last time we had fake patch clap, who was real mm. patch clap's friend who was pretending to be patch clap. And this time, because of the magic of the double header, where you can get pulled up the list if your number matches the number of someone above you. Real Patch has just slip streamed in behind Jason Wilkins. It's been an, an absolutely great 2023 for the Patch Clap clan. Mm. So Jason Wilkins has sent through one pound 49 and sent through a clue, which you don't have to do, but you can. He says, this relates to an innings by a true great in a tour game played in my hometown a while back. I may currently live in New Zealand, but I'm originally from the UK. That was yours, Adam. What did you make of it? Yes. Oh, I enjoyed this one. This was fun. Uh, so Jason, Richard Wilkins, I hope his mates call him Dickie, uh, great Australian. 149 GBP, looking at a tour game in England or Wales, probably by a visiting player, by the sort of essence of that clue. Mm-hmm. I don't do this often, but it's pretty hard to find like 149 in a tour game without some assistance from... Uh, outside so I put up the Andrew Sampson bat signal because I know his database deals with tour games and this helped streamline the process somewhat it was worthwhile too because I got to see all of the tour game centuries made and this was um, you know you can imagine how much fun (laughs) 
I had with that. <laughs> so there have been 13 instances where 149 have been made in a tour game in England. Clem Hill, it's quite tasty, 1905. Initially, I thought that's a pretty good mm. one. Um, all-time great, mm. tick. But it was at Old Trafford. And my sense with Jason describing it as his hometown, I just don't reckon it's going to be Manchester. Like Old Trafford feels mm-hmm. too big. Like I wouldn't describe it... Like, Town, I'm thinking outground. That's what. That's my bias mm-hmm. on this. So I put a line through Clem yep. Hill. All time great though. All time, All time great. great. I mean, Clem Hill would be up there. Through a selector out a window. I mean. That yes. gets you on the list. Yes. Uh, well, he is an all-time great. When he finished his career, he was the leading run scorer ever in, in Test cricket. Um, I also thought like Charlie McCartney made 149 in 1921, but that's in Bristol. Again, maybe mm-hmm. just too major a venue. Like it's a first-class primary venue, and I'm looking a little bit further afield. Okay. A bit of a segue here. I mentioned Teddy Hode off the top. I loved this. Teddy Hode was a West Indian batsman who had a modest career. He played four Test matches, both on tours mm-hmm. of England. And in those two tours, he made 149 not out twice in tour games. So oh. two of his eight first-class tons. As I say, it's a pretty neither here nor their career. He did get two tours of England, but both times he came to England, at Worcestershire in 1928 and Hove in 1933, he made unbeaten 149s. One away from the milestone you love, Jeff. Wow. And obviously a man after my own heart because he didn't give a shit about the 150. <laughs> he acknowledged that it was a nonsense milestone. Usman Kawaja had a good wave for it today. If you've already got a 50, then you've got a 100. You don't then get to go back to celebrating something smaller than increments of a 100. That's my philosophy, and I stick to it. Just on that, though, did you detect, and I kind of had the radio headphones on, so I was kind of listening to the you know, the crowd noise and whatnot. The crowd went nuts when he reached 150. Like, it was um, yeah. maybe because he'd been mm-hmm. out in the 140s so many times. I know he's made a couple of 150s no. before, but it felt like maybe because he, he'd been dismissed in the 140s a number of times in the last 12 months, possibly, at a stretch. I mean, that, that really stretches the knowledgeable crowd motif you know knowledgeable crowd here at the uh, scg they know all about usman kawaja's uh, finer details of his career no it's just that i mean even yeah sure he captains queensland now but he's still a hometown boy yeah yeah he's still from sydney and they know he's from sydney and they've seen him do the twin tons thing and then the other hundred and this was just another chance to give him a big cheer so they all did great happy days good on you but if you really want it if you really want to deserve it come back tomorrow and get a double then you deserve a clap. Have we put the Renshaw episode out again? Did I see that, Jeff, overnight? Just the clip. We just took a little clip out out of it. Oh, the clip of him talking about shitting himself. What great delivery, by the Mm. way, listening back to that little excerpt that that Cam Ponsonby pulled together for us, that Renshaw telling the story of shitting himself and his one regret being that he didn't stay in the middle and actually shit his pants to to offset any criticism of him. Yeah, he's um, he's got some some style about him in the way that he tells that yarn. To to prove his commitment to the cause, (laughs) I suppose. You know, no one can doubt your commitment to the cause if you're willing to do that wearing whites. Right, so moving ahead. So I've I've spoken about Teddy Hode in 1928, 1933. What about the year after in 1934? This must be what Jason's referring to. I'm tipping he's a man of Kent, specifically a man of Folkestone, where Australia did play on that tour. Now, the odd find, though, wasn't so much the tour game at Folkestone. It's when it was in the tour. I never knew this. They kept playing loads of first-class cricket in this era after they'd played the fifth test match. So the fifth test is at the Oval in August 1934. There's the 451 run stand that we've spoken about before on story time between Ponsford in his final test, making 266 and Bradman. But they played seven more first class games before getting on the boat. They don't play seven first class (laughs) games in the whole tour these days. They play the five tests and two warm-ups and fuck off. So Kent was the second to last tour game, but that was actually at Canterbury. They still played two more games after that. And the penultimate game of their tour was Australia against the England 11, weirdly, at the Folkestone Festival. It's a lovely spot there, right on the beach in the sort of southeast corner of England, looking out towards France. But what on earth is this game all about? An England 11 in a three day game, you know, a month after the Ashes have finished, Chapman's captaining, Hammond's playing. I mean, it's a proper side, right? Les Ames is keeping as well, who was the first choice keeper. There are some notable stranger names in there that you wouldn't recognise, but most of the players there are test cricketers for a three day hit out a month after the final test. These were weird times, Jeff. We would have loved it. So, okay, so who are they up against? So it's the touring. Australian sides of that year so Ponsford and Bradman and whatnot are playing yeah yeah yeah. I mean they're all playing and not only playing um, Bradman goes on to make this you won't be surprised to hear that it is Bradman an unbeaten 149 against the England 11 given the tour that he had but there's a bit in this in this innings 
It's his seventh century on tour. It enables him to pass 2,000 runs on the tour. So imagine that. Again, he made 2,000 first-class runs on tour, but he brought it up at Folkestone uh, against the England eleven, And he made it in just 104 minutes. When you look at best facts about Bradman, this innings actually comes up quite a bit because it's one of his quickest first-class hundreds. 149 in 104 minutes, 17 fours, four sixes. And cop this, cop this. Titch Freeman, final word favourite. I'd say he's like in our top five favourites of all time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, didn't go so well for Titch with his leg breaks from his low trajectory. 31 overs, two for 128 in the innings. Most notably though, Bradman took 30 from one of his overs. Eight ball over? Six ball over? Nope, six ball overs. So it was Bradman's equal biggest return in and over in professional cricket was in this game room at 149 at Folkestone. So um, there were still occasional first-class games played there until 1991 as an outground where Kent would play. The final first-class game there was against the students of Cambridge in 1995. I was thrilled to read, Jeff, in passing as I finished this long answer. The last first-class game played there against Cambridge University in 1995 included a century from my mate Dave Fulton who made 116 for Kent. That was the final century at Folkestone. Don Bradman made one um, some decades before, something he'll always share with the Don. Dave Fulton, who is still uh, a senior member of the broadcasting world (laughs) over here, uh, and they've been drawn together by uh, the festival in the southeast of England, and in Bradman's case, doing it in 1934 in a tour game. Goodness me. You remember when we talked to Sam Billings about the Hobart test a few weeks ago, and his description of the England team at that point was heads on the plane. (laughs) Do you wrap up the fifth test and you've got to play seven more first class matches? I mean, Maybe it's maybe it's in, in those days, you know, you have to get back on a ship for four months and, you know, catch diphtheria on the way back and lose a couple of your team overboard and whatnot. But well, well they, they play one more. They play one more of these weird games. I think we've looked at these before, Jeff. The Leveson Gower 11 um, played against Australia oh, yeah. before they got back on the boat. So they play, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the two odd games at the end. They play five first class counties after the final test. And Bradman skips all of those. So, you know, you talk about the 2000 run season. He gave himself five games off after the final test match. Um, So he could have ended up making, you know, in theory, like 3000 runs or or near enough to it had he got in a roll and averaged 100 as he tended to do. (laughs) Okay, well, that certainly counts as a great of the game and certainly counts as a small ground. So uh, thanks to Andrew Sampson for giving us a kick along. The 149 for Jason Wilkins. As for real patch clap, I'm going to go with a much more obvious answer. But this this sort of feels right because I get the sense from correspondence that real patch is, you know, an Australian man more or less of one's age and era, that kind of thing. And also given that I keep seeing Adam Gilchrist wandering around the media centre, when I think 149s, I think Adam Gilchrist. And... I know that we've talked about the Hobart 149 a lot with the big run chase against Pakistan in 1999, his second test match, proves himself to a sceptical Australian public, you know, the big partnership when it looks like they're going to lose that test match, Langer and Gilchrist put on heaps, the big run chase, all the rest of it. Um, And the fact that the entire ground is all badged in and set badging, which, Mm. you know, every time I wear one of my vintage (laughs) authentic and set tops, surprised by the reaction people love it they're always like oh and set shirt you know there's there's this real nostalgia around it and that covers that Hobart test match but so we talk about that 149 but there's the other 149 as well at the other end of the career in the World Cup final of 2007 and they bookend it you know they it, it's the start of Gilchrist and the winding down of Gilchrist really that World Cup final where he comes into it and and we remember it for being a shambles at the end and Sri Lanka playing in the dark and you know Rudy Kurtzen turning the headlights on in the car and all of the rest of it and we remember all the the overtold story about the squash ball in the glove and how it helped Gilchrist rejig his grip and and all the rest of it but just watching it back today I'm like bloody hell that's a hell of an inning so I remember watching it in some bar in the CBD of Melbourne you know not not a good place but it had it on a big screen and my memory of it is almost exactly the same as watching the video back which isn't always the case which is that every big shot he hits is straight down the ground for the first you know 100 runs that Australia put on they're just lofted straight drives basically sometimes to the onside sometimes to the offside but he just goes dead straight dead straight dead straight and it's not like he's up against 
a bad attack. He's got Chimindavas and Muralithra and, and that era overlapping with young Laseth Malinga. They've got clever T20 spinners with Jaya Surya and Dilshan knocking around. Dilara Fernando wasn't too bad either. And he's just like, I'll just hit you straight down the ground for either four or six and, and I'll keep on doing it. And he just keeps on doing it. So 50 of the first 70 runs are Gilchrist. By the time the 100 comes up, he's got 74 of 104. And then he raises his century with 148 on the board. So Matthew Hayden's just at the other end, knocking it about and and turning the strike over, basically. Gilchrist, as far as I can remember and as far as I could tell, doesn't play a cross-bat shot until they've got about 120 on the board. Then he plays a few pull shots and slog sweeps and whatever. But basically, he's like, cool, pitch it up and I'll hit it down the ground. Your memories of that innings were probably be just as strong as mine. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Jeff. I've got a bit of a confession to make. So I flicked it on just as you brought up the century. But I um, I was at Labor Party National Conference. That was the, um, the Kevin Rudd conference before we won in... 2007 so it was bloody exciting you know naturally you have a thousand beers at a Chinese restaurant and kick on and, and all the rest of it so I um, despite a my succulent best, Chinese meal it was a succulent I'm sure it was if it was a dinner with the Sussex Street lot in New South Wales it would have been a succulent Chinese meal it always was I don't remember precisely where that night took us but it, it took me away from watching the cricket and I only got back to where I was staying in time to watch the 100 being brought up and I remember having to rush to the airport like Two hours later, as was the way with me, um, in time to um, watch uh, the, the farcical scenes at the end with bad light kind of nearly ending play and them finishing with the spinners. But yes, it's a World Cup final that I watched very little of. <laughs> it's also notable that featuring strongly on the commentary Michael Atherton and Mark Nicholas, which is kind of funny given that they're colleagues of Gilchrist now, but they're like yeah. going on about what a what a great player he is and, and has been. And also that less than a year after that he's done, he goes on one more one day tour to India, one more tri series at home, makes one more hundred in Perth and, and then that's that. Wraps it up. So the book ended one four nines for me, patch clap. That's what I'm going for, the Adam Gilchrist 149s. You, Adam, have $1.55 in Aussie currency from Bill Apter with a clue Mm -hmm. that says this. My nerd pledge is a genuine dusty old bastard Mm -hmm. whose only first-class appearance was in the mid-19th century. Two clues. I've just visited Queenstown, and he was W.G. Grace's cousin. I love the show. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Bill. We will. Dusty old bastards right in your area. How dusty? Yeah, this this was fun. I mean, it's not dusty in the sense of playing test cricket, but it's dusty nevertheless. So thanks, Bill, for giving me the chance to learn a little bit uh, about the history of this part of New Zealand. So, okay, first of all, let, let's um, rule people out as um, WG Grace was related to fucking everybody, right? Like you look at his cricket info page and there are so many relatives who also played professional cricket. He had a cousin called William Pocock, who was a Kiwi and Australian. I thought it might be him, but um, he was from Canterbury and Queenstown is in Otago, so in different parts of the country. Then I thought, oh, here we go, Walter Gilbert. But unfortunately, Walter Gilbert can't really qualify as a dusty old bastard because he played too much cricket in England. However, what about Mm -hmm. similar name, William Gilbert Rees? Got him, got him. Because William Gilbert Rees was a serious figure in the history of Queenstown. It's some story. He was quite the man. Actually, he's almost identified as having founded Queenstown as we know it today. But let's go back a little bit. He's born in Pembrokeshire, Jeff, where we stayed in the 2015 tour, one day tour when we were in Cardiff in Wales. And on the recommendation of a couple of swingers, they said, why don't you two tomorrow drive out to Pembrokeshire? And so we did. And we stayed at that their mate's place who I can't remember what he did. He did something to do with the harbour there and he was running an Airbnb on the side or something like that or a hostel possibly. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah. It was a hostel kind of arrangement. There were some bunks, small place on the coast, chilly and attractive. So he's born over there in Wales in 1827. He emigrates to New South Wales in 1852, William Gilbert Rees, where he becomes a farmer. But he's also an explorer. So he goes over to New, to New Zealand, which is, I guess, more interesting for him to travel around. And he gets all the way on foot into Otago. He went across New Zealand, started a homestead in what now is known as the middle of Queenstown, which to that point hadn't had that kind of exploration from white settlers. Gold was found nearby and the place thrives thereafter. So While he was in New Zealand, he just takes to cricket. He's one of the first cricketing pioneers in that country, bringing the game to New Zealand. And per the clue, he's a cousin of W.G. Grace. He's also W.G. Grace's godfather. In terms of the cricket piece and the first-class game he plays, he's in New South Wales in 1857. 
And while he's there, he turns out for the state in Sydney against Victoria in just the second ever match between, well, they, they weren't states then, they were colonies, weren't they? 18, 1857, the second intercolonial game between the Vicks and New South Wales. And it's a predictably wild scorecard. New South Wales are all out for 80 and 86. Our man top scores with 28 in the first dig. So 28 out of 80, not, not a bad effort in context. But Victoria, all out 63 and 38. So so they still win by 65 runs despite having only made 166 runs across two innings. And somehow, Jeff, that took three days. I mean, you look at that, you imagine that's all over in like four sessions, but they <laughs> cracked on for three days. We had a scoreboard still because his namesake was playing for the Vic. So another William Rees is playing for Victoria and it's another cousin of his exactly exactly the same name and another cousin mm. of WG Grace so keeping it all in the family there in that game but yeah everything's named after him in Queenstown there's the Central River the statue there in the middle of town the main hotel the main highway it's all named after William Gilbert Rees there in Queenstown he died in Blenheim in 1898 but why 155 for Bill Apter well that was his batting average across those two innings he made three in the second dig so 28 plus three divided by two 15.5 <laughs> was the batting average of quite the dusty old bastard but yes a pioneer as well and a, a cousin of WG, another WG, William Gilbert Rees. Maybe it was just the same Wilbert Rees playing for both teams because if you can just <laughs> rock up from say England, move to New South Wales go to New Zealand for a while be involved in founding towns, then just rock up back in New South Wales and say, oh hello I think I'll play in the intercolonial <laughs> match I know how to play cricket and they're like yeah whatever, I mean how do you prove that you should be allowed to play, who knows that you're, that you're good at playing cricket, you just show up and say that you are and you get a game basically it's like yep. Sunday style so then maybe he just puts his hand up for the Vicks as well you know, just pop me in both teams lads Love having a hit. I don't know. You, you, you uh, definitely you couldn't, couldn't rule it out. Yeah, I was going to say, you definitely couldn't rule it out. I'm not going to go to the next level of researching the other William Rees, but yeah, I, I'll take that on face value. Um, Jeff, you're next up. You've got a James Ralston and his 1610. Now, we have looked at this before. Indeed, I've looked at this before uh, yeah. and went to the 1610 runs made in a single test match, but I was not correct. And I'd also had a go at it. So this is irregular because I'm working this as a revisit into the main number but I ha feel I have to do this because because this answer is so good right. in the end. We both had goes at this and we knew that we were looking at we were looking for a world record and it involved an aggregate of runs in a match. And so we got to the 1610 from that England New Zealand test in 2015. That's right. And you really went long on this. Like you looked at every possible way to interpret that scorecard to find the world record you know most runs in boundaries runs in extras ah, yes. runs by certain numbers in the batting order all of that like highest score in an aggregate in england where a side had bowled first something like that where a side had bowled first and won and maybe, one, yeah, but, yeah, like but, yeah, and elected to bowl at the toss, I think, actually. And then there was another bit attached to that as well. There was one other match that satisfied that criteria. Right. So James finally, well, I mean, he tells me what's going on, but when I look into it, there's a lot more going on. So he says, I love that you worked so hard to try to figure this out. You were so close to the right answer. You had me doubting if I was right. <laughs> Mainly I wanted to highlight an attacking test match and I feel that an England match may beat this record in the near future. But the record is it is the most aggregate runs in a test where all 40 wickets have fallen and it was a five-day test match. Oh. So when we look into this, we will find, as, as you did last week, there are 21 matches that have higher aggregate run totals in history. Yeah. And we did look at whether all 40 wickets had fallen in those matches. We did. We did find that there were four others yeah. that had had a higher run tally where all 40 had fallen. So we said, well, it can't be that. We crossed that off. But have a look at these four test matches. Uh, not by coincidence. They're all timeless tests. So in 1911... South Africa come to Adelaide, and in 1921, England come to Adelaide, and they bat slowly, as per the style of the time, and both teams make at least 300, sometimes 400, sometimes 500 in each of the innings, in all of those mm. innings across those two matches. Um, and, in fact, the South Africa game, after 1,646 runs, is decided by 38 runs. They bowl out Australia for 339, chasing 378. But both of those games go for seven days, including one rest day. <laughs> so to, to, to advance on that, the next time England come to Australia in 1925, Australia make an even 600, Ponsford and Victor Richardson making a lot of runs. England make 479 with Sutcliffe and Hobbs. 
Um, and they both make lower scores in the second innings. It ends up being Australia by 81 runs. But all of that happens after eight days of play <laughs> with one rest day. <laughs> And then, Blimey. this is even better because it's actually on the same trip, but earlier on the same trip in Sydney in December 1924. Uh, so there are three innings in the match worth more than 400. And this is the best bit. They all come at a good clip, right? So they're actually scoring at a reasonable rate. They're not just crawling along. In the fourth innings, England, chasing 605, go at 4.24 runs and over and make 411 in the fourth innings. Oh, baseball. Oh, it's a new invention. Oh, playing attacking test. No, it's fucking not. They were doing it 100 years ago. Get with the program. Hobson Sutcliffe ball. Sort that out. So they still lose by a heap. But I, given the speed of the scoring, the only thing I can figure is there must have been rain about because that match goes for nine days and involves two rest days because it just went on for so long that they had to keep playing. Thus, the record that we have is the highest aggregate run total in a match that was completed within five days uh, because you have four timeless tests that all went the distance. James, that was fun. Uh, you've, you've, um, yes, we've had, I think, three proper bites of the cherry of that. I'm glad we got there in the end. Thanks for your assistance in doing so. <laughs> 1610, James Ralston. Uh, next is me, Scott Munro. 279 GBP from Scott Jeffy has a clue for me. He says this, I've been bulk listening to story time while working from home. Uh, that is a, a strong choice and yes. comes highly recommended. My pledge, says Scott, is a series score for a player in his debut series in Test Cricket in a humbling defeat, but it did include a century on a cracked pitch. Well, I was pretty confident when I saw <laughs> this, what it was likely to be. I'll bet you were too. Yeah, it's the uh, what you've described, Jeff, before as the computers in freezers week at the Wacker um, back in 2013. <laughs> it can be none other than the current England captain uh, when he was a pup, Ben Stokes. Just on quantum to begin. So 279 is the number here. It is quite noteworthy just the fact that he makes those 279 runs in four test matches and leads England's averages in that series with an average of 34.9. So what's more remarkable is how shit everybody else was, how mediocre. Peterson, 294 mm. at 29. Carberry, who did pretty well in the circumstances, but nevertheless, 281 at 28.1. Cook, 246. Bell, 235. Root, 192 at 28 before he was dropped for the final test match at Sydney. And, of course, Stokes wasn't there for the Brisbane test. He effectively came in for Jonathan Trott after Brisbane mm. where they did the reshuffle and he won cap 658. Then he had to spend 158 overs on his feet in the field and we've already spoken in the past about his no-ball wicket. He's part of that club with uh, Muhammad Musa Khan, Nassim Shah, Tom Curran, I think, are the four, and Stokes are the four who have taken their, their first wickets in test cricket in Australia, only, only to have them chalked off. Uh, Michael Beer as well, sorry, there's five of them. to have it chalked off as a retrospective no ball. Oh, and Jeff, just, just while I'm, 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 I'm speaking of, of stuff that you and I have campaigned for, of course, that was part of our, our case to advance uh, why they should change the way they adjudicate front foot no balls, and, and so they have the ICC bless them for it. The first message I received on New Year's Day morning was from Daniel Norcross in a real huff, and you'll appreciate it. And I'm not going to read the message out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to summarize this for you. The first thought Daniel had on the 1st of January was to get in touch and say, how do I speak to someone at the MCC? They desperately need to fix the law. And I'm like, what? What, Daniel, what's going on? Talk, yeah, he's been crooked. So I, 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 this is why he was awake early on New Year's Day. The law in relation, it's not even a law in the end, it's more a playing condition with the ICC, but the nightmare scenario where a batter shuffles across their stumps, last ball of World Cup final, four runs needed, the batter shuffles across their stumps, is given out leg before wicket, the ball trickles down to the rope for four leg buys. And because the leg before wicket is given on the field, even so in this scenario, the batter reviews and it's proven to be um, missing. It actually is a um, not out decision overturned by the third umpire. But the playing conditions, the way they stand, see the runs not count because the, the, the ball's dead from the moment that the, the finger goes up from the central umpire to call it league before wicket. And Daniel's like, it's inevitable. This is going to ruin a World Cup final. Is this something I think you've had a concern about as well, haven't you, in the past? <laughs> well, we did point it out at the time that that interpretation was put into writing, that if you make the ball dead after it's hit the pad, then you rule out the possibility of runs. Uh, the, um, the other point being that if there's if it's not out because, for instance, there's an inside edge on it, 
then it's not even a matter of whether a player deserves leg buys or not. You know, you can exactly. get an inside edge onto a ball that ricochets off the pad, goes away, whether it's for one run or whatever it might be. You need one run to tie and go into a super over, for instance. And you then get the run chalked off because it's the, the, the ball's ruled to be dead. Now, if you're an umpire who's smart and you know what's happening and both teams have reviews, then you just give it not out because you rely on the bowling team to review um, and that way, at least the ball is still live until such time as the review uh, comes through. He's got an answer. You, you, you won't be surprised to hear that Daniel's got a, got a solution. I wonder what you think of mm. this. I wonder what you make of this. Okay. That with leg before wicket dismissals, where DRS is a factor, so anything we're watching on telly, the finger doesn't go up until the runs have been complete. So the umpire might think it's out, but they don't make the mm. they don't put their finger up or put their or, or say not out until the end of the the running component. Which I advance the view that what would be most hilarious is if a batter runs three leg buys in that scenario and then has the finger put up to them right in front of their face <laughs> at them on striker's end. But um, uh. but anyway, so I, I, I'm just digressing there because I, when I was writing this on New Year's Day, um, I remembered the front foot no ball stuff with Stokes and we we got that campaign up and maybe via the final word we can give Daniel a platform to get this change with the ICC yeah. as well. It ruins the atmosphere though. The big, you know, the ball swings in, hits the pad, everybody goes up and the umpire says, wait till they've finished running. <laughs> you know, I mean, the rhythms of it on commentary you know, hits him on the pad. Everybody's gone up in an appeal. They've come back for the second, turning for the third, <laughs> completed the third, and he's given him. Oh, but, know, but, but, just, but it genuinely might be the only way to resolve this. Like Daniel, who's put some thought yeah. into this, says he can't think of any other way of squaring it where that nightmare scenario wouldn't play out. And what you described before about mm -hmm. the onus being on the fielding team. Remember that, or the, or the umpire to give it not out. Remember that the stumps are bigger when the ball's given, when the wicket's given out by the central umpire because of umpire's review. The fielding side is to the advantage when the decision's given out on field. Anyway, back to Ben Stokes. Back to Ben Stokes. I'll quickly whip through this. <laughs> he showed a bit in his second dig at Adelaide, his second innings at Adelaide on Test Taboo. He made 28, but better for a couple of hours. And that translated through to Perth. We had a fantastic Test match. He knocked over Clark and Smith with the ball. In Smith's case, hit plenty of runs by that point, but he was up and about. Then in the second innings, when all was lost, he walked out with England at four for 100, chasing 500 kind of thing. And he starts with the most stunning dead straight drive off Mitchell Johnson at 150 clicks. Then he pulls him in front of square a couple of times on the cracked pitch that's referred to in the clue by Scott Munro. Like nobody was pulling Mitchell Johnson off their eyes or hooking Johnson in that series at that pace, but he was happy to do so. Um, the commentators were totally purring on Channel 9. You know, at least there was finally some pushback for Australia pretty deep into the series. Hits another glorious on drive off Ryan Harris, an in-swinger to move to 50. Like, he held his shape with the ball round the wicket, booming back towards his middle stump. So again, a kind of a touch of class from a young man who was only 21 at the time. Comes back the next day and picks up from where he left off with, a, with another off drive this time down the ground of Harris to move into the 80s. On 98, gets a bumper from Johnson, hooks him away over his shoulder, just over Brad Haddon's outstretched right glove, gets a boundary, moves to a century. England's only century of the tour. He celebrates mm -hmm. by dancing at Lyon a couple of times and lofting him over long on for six. Um, he ends up under edging Lyon on 120 and the Ashes are gone soon after that. A couple of unconverted starts at Melbourne. Then at Sydney, takes six for 99 and finishes the series with 47 and 32 in the absolute car crash that was England's three-day loss at the SCG. So all of that adds up to 279 runs in his maiden series, plus 15 wickets and surely the only positive for England out of 2013-14. Well, if you'd been chasing that 500 now, he would have just got them. Just <laughs> gone and got the runs. Easy. Just go out there and get them. Go there and smash Mitchell Johnson. Get him in four days. Right. Don't want to come back fifth well, day. Yeah. Want a day off. No. Nah. Got things to do. <laughs> fifth day. That makes sense. That works. That works for me. That's what I thought. That's what you think. I've got a, a new pledger in Francis Keepfer. Welcome to the fun. Sixteen pounds forty three pence. Sixteen forty three. No clue. Open to me to interpret it. Mm -hmm. I did find that it's currently Mark Wood's batting average, 16.43, but that is because he bashed a couple of 30s while basballing it in the Pakistan series. And I don't think that Francis necessarily has enough future predicting powers to have been able to pick that a couple of months ago that Mark Wood's batting average as of the 5th of January would be 16.43. Did you uh, ever hear the joke, Adam, about the tiny psychic who escaped from prison no please tell me more they said that there was a small medium at large <laughs> very good very good 
right in your, so, right in your swinging arc there. <laughs> right. So what it is, I think, as a number, in terms of an average over a, a more predictable period of time in that it has now concluded, is the bowling average of SF Barnes. Uh, we've talked about Sid Barnes quite a lot, Adam, and we've talked about bowling averages a lot and 1800s bowling averages yes. a lot recently because of Scott Boland. You know, the last year or so, there's been a lot of averages chat. Scott Boland currently at 12.21 runs per wicket, which is still there and thereabouts. Um, for a while, he had the best average of anyone who'd taken 10 wickets. Um, then it was the best average of anyone who'd bowled as many balls as he has done. It's crept up a bit now because he had a couple of normal sort of innings during the Melbourne Test match where he'd take a couple of wickets for, say, 40 instead of for, say, four. Um, and, it it and was at its absolute it's best. When he, the best bit that it got to was when he had... Um, when nobody had taken more wickets at a lower average, including mm-hmm. George Lohman. Which has shifted a bit now because so Scott Boland has still only bowled 931 balls in Test cricket. So he's just under halfway because the mm-hmm. statistician accepted mark is 2,000 deliveries. They don't count that in overs because the length of overs changes over the course of Test history. You've got four balls, five, six, eight. You know who's getting close to 2,000 balls? Big Marco. Now, that's oh. relevant. Marco's got a chab on. Okay. That's relevant because um, that's a niche joke for you peep show fans out there. He has the lowest strike rate. He's got a better strike. Well, until five minutes ago, he had a better strike rate than Lohman. So he could hit mm. 2,000 balls and overtake George Lohman, which would be bloody exciting. Mm, not sure if he'll do it after this inning that's going on at the SCG. But yeah, approximately in six ball overs, 333 overs will get you to the 2,000 delivery mark, which means you need more than just a series you know you need to have played a chunk of test matches in order to qualify so George Lohman is number one in the qualifying group you know the king of the goat tracks in the 1880s he took 112 wickets in 18 tests which is insane when you think about it Um, 10.75 runs a piece hence the Boland obsession over the last period of time. People are like, why do you keep talking about Scott Boland's bowling average? And we're like, because in the modern era, it is impossible for anybody to get anywhere near what used to happen, given the absolute shit heaps that they used to play cricket on. Like they just used to rock up and hurl the ball down on untilled fields. You know, someone would have just run through there with a plough to put some asparagus in or whatever they were doing at that point in time. And then you just rock up and play a game on it. It'd rain, it'd get muddy, it'd dry out, there'd be craters in it. And then someone would come on and bowl and take their wickets at 10.75 runs apiece. And so someone doing it now is statistically fascinating enough to follow. So JJ Ferris is the next, 12.7 runs per over. There's Billy Barnes and Billy Bates in the low 16s, and then there's Sid Barnes, FF Barnes, our guy. The real freak show, he's the one who's doing it in the 1900s, the others are all 1800s, and he's playing before the First World War. World record wickets with 189, which we've talked about before, and he's taking them at 16.43 runs apiece. So we have chatted about SF Barnes. The, the fact that everybody at his time, talks about him as being someone who swung the ball and then turned it off the surface. Like, he's a medium-paced swing bowler who's also a spinner. I still can't figure out if this is just kind of some collective hallucination or whether he was able to do something that has never been done since or before. I haven't quite figured that out, but tall, cranky dude who probably would have played a lot more tests for England if he hadn't been irritable and Mm. decided to tell him to fuck off a bunch of times when either he wasn't getting paid enough money Mm. or paid enough respect or whatever it might be. Yeah, that that all pretty much lines up and yeah, any chance we any chance we get to speak about Barnes's career we should because it does, as you say, it always stands out. Like there's a couple of sort of totemic figures in the early years of Test cricket. Lohman and Barnes, JJ Ferris is another who's just got freakish numbers and um, Any time that a player gets close to them. And the other one last year was Father Marriott, of course, who was our inaugural dusty old bastard, I think it was. I think he was the first, mm. very first um, time he played the music and Boland had his average beneath his 8.72, I think it was, for until his like, fourth test match or something. It was absurd. So anyway, happy days. <laughs> so SF Barnes mostly played against Australia. Six of his series came against Australia. Uh, came out here for the first time under celebrity racist Archie McLaren in 1901-02. He played the triangular test series in 1912 with South Africa, Australia, England. Played South Africa once home and away and the away series is that yes. high watermark of his when he takes 49 wickets in the series at 10. In four um, test matches. Only played f- 
Yeah, played four of the tests because in the last one he was supposed to get paid a bunch of money by the South Africans for coming and he hadn't been paid, so he cracked his shits and refused to play. So, you know, a, a, a straightforward, blunt sort of guy. But there is that sweet codicil story of him in his 90s when Wilfred Rhodes is in his 90s mm. and Rhodes has gone blind and Barnes is leading him around. They used to go to the test grounds and Barnes would guide him around and sit him down and describe what was happening out on the field. So there was a, a soft edge to a hard character. Very nice. Uh, thank you to Francis for letting Jeff have the chance to tell more stories about Barnes. Uh, our final new number of the day is from Ben Woolgar. It was 1770 AUD and it was a free hit for me. But Jeff, we did have something that you pulled up on the way through here as well. Well, I just wanted to give a, a little nod to Ruth Dow, uh, Lorna Ruth Dow, who didn't like the name Lorna and went by Ruth. It seems very common for there, there were a lot of a lot of people's grandmas when I was growing up had a name that they didn't like and then the middle name that they chose to go with. My grandma was was Roma, but she was Coral Roma and she hated Coral. Never call me Coral. Roma. So, you know, I, I identify a bit of that with Lorna Ruth Dow, but she played three tests, one against New Zealand and a couple against England in the late 1950s and picked up 10 wickets at 17.70. So worth remembering Ruth Dow. And also worth remembering that I might have to name a child at some point later today if things go the way it might. So I've uh, with, with Ruth. Rach. Uh, well, I, I think we're, we're all good on the girl's name. And I did get some kind support um, about the boy's name as well uh, from our friend Michael Cooney who got in touch to say and I'm surprised he didn't notice about me he goes what you should do if it's a boy is name them Tom call them Tommy but name them Tom Tom Collins the you know the great Australian author I'm like mate it's my great 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 uncle it's Joseph Furphy changed his name to Tom mm. Collins that's why my last name's Collins Dad changed his name to Collins when he was a, a young chap to mm -hmm. um, reflect the family history to get rid of the slightly awkward name that our family used to have. It had a couple of Zs in the surname. It was never anglicised or, or any of that. But some, I'm surprised Cooney, who is a, a student of history, and I've known him for a very, very long time, it's never come up in conversation that Tom Collins, I'm a descendant of. It's also a cocktail. Yeah. Tom Collins. So, And I think that's the reason why we probably couldn't proceed with that. Like it would be for more people than not, they'd be like, oh, the, so yeah. I, I wouldn't want a necessarily young boy to, to have to deal with that all the time. Although it is a pretty good name and it's a, it's a tough name, isn't it? Tom Collins. But yeah, we're going to have to look further afield there. But anyway, it's a reminder <laughs> with Ruth that I have uh, some responsibility ahead of me and ahead of us, Rach and I, sometime soon. 1770 for Ben Woolgar. Back to that. Um, there is no 17 for 70 in first class cricket, which I was both surprised and gutted by. I'm like, oh, this is great. This will be fun. Someone's day out. I can write. I can tell the story of that. But no, there was... A 17 for 67, though, Jeff, by guess who? We mentioned him at the start of the show. We'll do so at the end as well. Titch Freeman, oh. the little leggy for Kent against Sussex in 1922, took 17 for 67. Test 1770 is a belter, though. So I thought, let's do this. When I wrote this up, it was the day that we'd interviewed Cam Ponsonby on the show a couple of weeks ago who told us all about Multan. Well, the previous time that England played Multan was in 2005, and that was Test Match 1770, and as I say, it's a corker. It was the first of the series. Pakistan made 274 with uh, sports betting enthusiasts, Salman Butt, uh, making 74. So Butt top scores up against Hoggard, Harmison, Flintoff, Giles. So with the exception of Jones, it's pretty much the attack they... Uh, they used to beat Australia earlier in 2005. Also, there is Shaggy Udall and, and Paul Collingwood. I've seen that um, Sean Udall is going through a tough time at the moment with his health. He's been tweeting a lot about that in, in recent times, so all the very best to him. Um, for England, in response, uh, Triscothic led the way. He was leading them in that test, actually. He made 193, the top score. Ian Bell made 71. They are 418 all out. So a pretty healthy first innings lead of 138 with the stand-in captain. Big Trez making 193. Pakistan, the second time around, though, they recover well. They make 341. Salmon Butt in the runs again, top scoring with 122. And Inzi, who's the captain, Multan's own. What do they call him? The um, the mayor of Multan or the... The, the Multan Sultan. Multan perhaps. Sultan, whatever it is. He... He made 72 uh, deep into his career, leading the Pakistani test team. So England are only chasing 198. In baseball times, that'd be a T20 chase, like we joked before. They'd, mm. they'd try and do that in 30 overs just because they could. Not here. This was a different era. They made a total meal of it. Triscothic out early. Um, Strauss and Bell uh, failed to convert starts. 
before you know it, it's Garrett Jones coming in at number seven, having to hold things together. He makes 33, but he's the only player to get out of the teens. Uh, they're 166 for nine. They still need 32. Harmison Ooh. whacks a couple of boundaries, but then he gets out to shower back to, it's the final wicket, England, or all out for 175. Pakistan take the test match by 22 runs, coming back from a deficit of 138 in the first inning. So one of the biggest turnarounds in, in test cricket. Not often you see turnarounds of anywhere around 150 or above. It's one of Shah Bakhtar's last great performances. He blew up England's top order, taking three for 49. And Danish Canaria, another sports betting enthusiast, was instrumental in the final day as well. Four for 62, and in classic Danish Canaria fashion, four for 62 and didn't take a maiden. I wonder why. So, uh, <laughs> yes, that was the best uh, That was the best chance England had in that series. They drew in uh, Faisalabad and got pumped in Lahore. Uh, but yes, test 1770, a good one. Uh, the 28th closest of all time. Oof, it'd be nervous times in that dressing room for YouTube influencer Inzama Malhaq if you're relying <laughs> on Salman Butt and Danish Canaria to get you a win. You're like, well, maybe it'll happen today. Who knows? Who knows which way the market's running? Um, maybe it won't. Right, that is the end of the new numbers on the show. Uh, if you want to send in a number, go to patreon.com slash the final word. You join up there, you send a number, that helps us keep making the show. We have a huge year coming up, so the more people we can get on there helping, the better it will be and the more things we'll be able to do. I've got one confirmation that I want to throw in because okay. not that Tim mentioned, I ran into him in Brisbane. Well, I didn't run into him. We organised final word catch-ups at the pub and he came. Uh, and he told me this in person, and now he sent it through in text form as well, to say this, to say, Adam, you absolutely nailed my nerd pledge. Now, if you remember, his nerd pledge was 621, and you said that it must be the wrongly reported figures <laughs> that Scott Boland had taken six wickets in 21 balls because it was actually in 20 balls. <laughs> Adam, not that says you've nailed it. With all bases covered, I appreciate you not assuming that I was a digit off regarding the 6 for 22 collapse, because I heard the stat about six wickets and 21 balls reported over and over at the time, and that's why I made it my pledge. A wicket every three and a half balls is incredible. Only last week did I actually go back and check the ball by ball coverage and notice that my number might be wrong, but I Googled Boland six in 21 balls and found thousands of results. So I decided to stick with the error and I will happily blame the media. But for you, he says, brilliant solve and it was thank you not that i'm really glad that that my hunch was correct although messy jez reckons we're wrong messy jez reckons it's 16 19 balls in fact he's adamant that it's actually 16 19 not 16 20 and that we've counted this incorrectly <laughs> so. isn't, isn't this is, is this like um he's not 29 no, he's, <laughs> he's 28, 28 till he's 29 he's 28 till he's 20 i i i think it's look <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there because I don't want to go back through the card again. But um, yes, um, that is uh, that. Is, that is, either way, it's definitely not six in twenty-one balls. It's either twenty or nineteen. Either Messi Jez has got it wrong, or we've got it slightly wrong. But I'm glad that's one that we were able to get right. We are going to do it. I, I should... mean, it, it seems pretty easy to be categorical about. <laughs> Can you check it? Can you do me a favour after the show? I, I've got a pretty busy day sure. ahead, as you might have detected, but I, I, I'm going to ask you to just verify that, do a bit of um, fact-checking. I just wonder if it's one of those ones, you know, remember the weightlifting forum, three workouts a week means seven workouts every two weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> Every, every two days, a workout every two days means it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. No, don't no. miss. Just don't miss. <laughs> but Sunday just, and Monday are next day, to each mate. other. No, but that's the next week. That's Monday's in the next week. <laughs> As long as as long as, as long as you're not skipping leg day, um, you're all you're all good. <laughs> uh, I, that's the one thing I know about gym junkies that you can't skip leg day. Mm -hmm. as, as tempting as no. it is, not, not that I'm any work on the glamour of, muscles. Not that I'm any major no. threat of that. Although I have been going to yoga. Won't be going to yoga today. I've just re I just remembered Jeff in our discussion then that I've got the second half of my root canal planned later today. I might have to cancel that. We are oh. go we are going to do um, our revisit special now. The plan was to get this done before um, the birth. That's unlikely to happen, but. Um, we mm. will find a way to do the mega revisit special before. Well, it'll have to be before I go to India because we've got to go to India. Got to go, and that's on the seventh of February. So it might be instead of being next week, the revisit special might be maybe 
three weeks away. So we might stick with this current story time formula, just dealing with new numbers for the time being. And we'll do a bit of admin behind the scenes to ensure that when we do the revisit special that we're you mm-hmm. know getting the numbers right. Yes, well, new babies, new numbers, whatever it might be. If I have to ring people in to help, so be it. At, at times like this, Adam, a community pulls together. Mm. Um, and if that means finding someone else to host your podcast, <laughs> then, then that is something that we can do. <laughs> it's the, yes, it's the essence of who we are. Um, right. Um, on that note, uh, I should probably go and see how Rach is going. She hasn't knocked on the door, so yep. I'm sure she's going fine. Uh, right. I, I, look forward to, um, I look forward to telling you guys all about it as we make our way through the next couple of eventful days. This has been Storytime 118. Um, It'll be 180 at some point because we can't stop and we won't stop on the final word. (laughs) Thank you to everybody for your support. Um, Patreon.com forward slash the final word, as you said before. Jeff, we would love to get more people on board this year. It just gives us more flexibility with what we can do with the the Patreon account as well. Like the more people who are there, the more options we have for sort of unique content and stuff that um, kind of pays for itself through that. And of course, it's going to be a bloody expensive year without making too fine a point of this with us um, hoofing it to India, then an Ashes series, men's and women in England. And then of course, the Men's World Cup up seven weeks in India later this year. So this is a great time. If, you, if you're on the fence and thinking about it, this is a great time to hit that button. Patreon.com forward slash the final word. Pop in a nerd pledge and join the fun on Discord as well. Um, there's going to be, well, I was going to say, there's going to be a Discord meetup on Saturday in London, Jeff. I don't know whether I'm going to make it. Maybe we can wet the head. Um, I'm, I'm going with uh, with Caroline and Lauren to um, to watch Dalit Hamlet play at, um, at Champion Hill and whoever else wants to join is welcome yeah. to. By Saturday afternoon, it's improbable that we'll be wetting the head. Um, I'll probably be in the, in the labor ward somewhere but it's it's an outside chance and we keep doing those types of things that are organized through the discord page which you get unlocked via being a patron and if you are a patron and haven't joined discord simply drop us a line drop us a dm or an email and we'll send you the the, the backdoor code straight away all right uh, i am gonna see if i have to jump the fence to get out of the scg <laughs> i've done it at cricket grounds before and i will probably do it again all right that sounds good to me they're usually pretty nice the scg security guards if you go through the members gate in my experience have fun with that uh, we'll do this all again you'll be back on the daily show throughout the sydney test and i'll be back well i don't quite know when but it'll be soon enough bye for now see ya.